Impeachment is a rare event, and as the nation has watched the last weeks of public hearings, we've naturally wondered how this time in history compares to the others. To answer that question, I spoke with three historians last week, each focused on a former president who had to deal with the threat of impeachment. To tell us about Bill Clinton's impeachment, Peter Baker joins us. He is chief White House correspondent at The New York Times and co-author of Impeachment and American History. On Richard Nixon, Timothy Naftali joins us. He is a professor at New York University and former director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. And he also co-authored Impeachment and American History. And for Andrew Johnson, Brenda Wineapple joins us. She is the author of The Impeachers, The Trial of Andrew Johnson and the Dream of a Just Nation. Thank you all of you for being here. And Peter, I'll start with you. I wanna go kind of backwards in time here. If you had to give sort of a 90 second history lesson on what the story of Bill Clinton's impeachment was about, how would you do that? Well, it's hard to do in 90 seconds, but we'll give it a try. <laughs> Look, we had President Clinton got caught up uh, in a sex scandal. He was being accused of sexual harassment in a lawsuit, and as part of that lawsuit, he was asked to testify about his relationship with other women. He lied about a relationship with a former intern named Monica Lewinsky. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And the House ultimately impeached him along party lines for perjury and obstruction of justice. I hereby deliver these articles of impeachment. He went to the Senate for trial, but he ended up getting acquitted on a pretty strong vote. The prosecutors didn't get more than 50 votes, uh, even though they needed 67 to convict him. It is therefore ordered and adjudged that the said William Jefferson Clinton be, and he hereby is, acquitted of the charges in the said articles. That was the crux of it, but really at its heart, of course, are all kinds of interesting questions about accountability, balance of power, separation of powers, what's important uh, in terms of impeachment, what constitutes a high crime misdemeanor, and these are the issues we see today as well. I want to say again to the American people how profoundly sorry I am. Tim Naftali, what about you? Tell us the story of Richard Nixon's impeachment and what was at stake there? Well, Richard Nixon gets caught up uh, in a, an espionage and uh, break-in story. In the summer of 1972, a group of burglars are caught breaking into the Democratic National Committee's headquarters in the Watergate. This leads to some excellent journalism, largely by Woodward and Bernstein. And after the 1972 election, a special Senate Watergate committee looks into uh, issues and questions of misconduct in the campaign. That leads to very celebrated public hearings. Good evening from Washington. In a few moments, we're going to bring you the entire proceedings in the first day of the Senate Watergate hearings. The committee will come to order. No one's talking about impeachment at that point. We are beginning these hearings today in an atmosphere of utmost gravity. But public hearings that bring out the possibility that the president himself was involved in a cover-up and the fact that the president is taping his conversations in the White House. I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. There might not have been an impeachment inquiry at all, but the president is very nervous because in, in addition to the Senate looking into him, there is a special prosecutor that's looking into him, and that special prosecutor wants access to those tapes. The president does not want those tapes to go to the special prosecutor. He fights it, and when he doesn't get what he wants, and is on the verge of losing in court, he fires the special prosecutor. And not only does he fire Archibald Cox, but he tries to put the entire independent investigation out of business. That sends a shockwave through the country, after something called the Saturday Night Massacre. And it is then that not just Democrats, who control both houses, by the way, in Congress at that time, but Republicans, too, join and say, we need to investigate. From that point, in late 73 until August of 74, the House is engaged in an impeachment inquiry. Ultimately, the House votes uh, three articles of impeachment. All three have bipartisan support. Before those articles of impeachment can be voted on by the entire House, Richard Nixon, who understands his support is crumbling, Richard Nixon resigns. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Richard Nixon's Vice case involved obstruction of justice and abuse president. of power. And it's that abuse of power element of the Watergate story that seems so relevant in the current discussion of, water, of uh, impeachment. And we're going to dig through some of those issues you raised there in a bit more detail. But Brenda Wineapple, over to you. Tell us the story of Andrew Johnson and his impeachment proceedings. Johnson was impeached just three years after the Civil War. 
And when you think about what was going on there and that the country was in need, desperate need, of putting itself back together again, you had a chief executive who assigned himself the role of not so much peacemaker, but a, a person who restored uh, the South or wanted to restore the South to its former supremacy, which was white supremacy. And it wasn't a question of treason or bribery. But when Andrew Johnson actually broke a law that Congress had passed in order to rein him in so that Johnson would execute the laws of Congress, which um, really restored civil rights and finally voting rights to black men in the South to give them representation in the country. Uh, when Johnson broke that law, the House had no choice, it felt, and voted overwhelmingly to impeach Andrew Johnson. So technically, he was impeached because he stepped on a statute, because he violated a law, he broke the law. But it had been a long time coming, and for many, many people in the country, and certainly in Congress, among the Republicans, felt that he had been abusing power, denying the legitimacy of Congress, and obstructing justice um, and the law for much, much too long. And he was really squandering, they felt, the victory, the Union victory, which had, which had abolished slavery, but not its effect. Central to these narratives is, of course, how each of these presidents reacted in the time, in the moment, to the impeachment proceedings. Peter, I'll come back to you here. What do we know, and how would you characterize the Clinton reaction to the impeachment proceedings? Well, Clinton took the approach of being above it all. That's the, the, the image he wanted to project to the country. He was focused on the people's business. He wasn't going to get down in the dirt with all these other people who were obsessed with scandal. And he tried to, therefore, basically shove it off to, you know, to the side, in effect. He wasn't going to dignify it, if you will, with being too obsessed by it in public. Behind the scenes, of course, he was obsessed by it. He was consumed by it. He was filled with rage and grievance and anger and, 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 and unhappiness and resentment. He was so uh, absorbed by it that people would leave meetings with him and say it was, it was like he wasn't even there. One of his aides during a trip to the Middle East when he was, in, I think, in Gaza trying to negotiate uh, Middle East peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis noticed mm -hmm. over his shoulder, they it's noticed the evening. president writing on his notepad, focus on your job, focus on your job. You know, he was trying very hard to project this idea of, of, of a president who was unaffected, but in fact, he was, as any person, I suppose, would be uh, quite, you know, uh, consumed by it in private. Now, the difference between him and the other two presidents is he was very popular at the time. So he had a wellspring of public support. His numbers were above 60 percent approval rating throughout the entire investigation by Ken Starr and the House impeachment and Senate trial. In fact, it went up, not down, the day after the impeachment vote in the House went up to 73 percent. So he had that sort of basic, uh, you know, uh, political base to work from that other presidents didn't have. But behind the scenes, of course, it was an all-consuming thing for him. Brenda, what about you? What do we know? Obviously, we didn't have tweets in real time reacting to what was going <laughs> on in any of the proceedings. But what do we know about the way that Andrew Johnson was reacting to those proceedings? If Andrew Johnson could have tweeted, he would have been tweeting. <laughs> believe me. Um, he really, he, he was aggrieved, too, just like Peter was saying Clinton was. Um, and he wanted to take his case to the people. Uh, he understood what impeachment was, but it was almost as if he didn't. And he thought that if he could go on a series of rallies and get people behind him, that somehow none of this would be happening. And his lawyers very deftly and very carefully warned him to stay in the White House, which they made him do. Um, he wanted to testify in his own behalf, but they were really afraid. He was a very pugnacious person, and they were very afraid of what he might say, what he might do, and that he could further alienate people who may have been wobbling. And there were a couple who really were. Tim, I found it so interesting. You told my colleague earlier that in the moment, Richard Nixon actually withdrew. He was not out there publicly advocating for himself. But I'm curious about how the rest of his party reacted. It's so interesting we see now Republicans in the House really standing by President Trump, staunchly defending him. Was that true of, of President Nixon and his party at the time? In 1974, the public had no idea that the leadership of the Republican Party was hoping that Richard Nixon would resign. When he didn't resign, those leaders felt they had no choice but to stand behind him. They discovered that there was a lot of support for Richard Nixon outside of Washington. And so they decided they had no better alternative than to stand by him. What happens in this story is that 
rank and file Republicans, the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee, as they absorb the data that's amassed for them, they come to the conclusion that Richard Nixon staying in power would be a threat to the Constitution. And they decided against their political judgment and their political uh, fortunes and against the recommendations of the leaders of the Republican Party to vote against the president. So there's a, there are two different stories there. There's a the story of the Republican leadership in 1974, which ultimately stands behind Nixon. And there's a the story of the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee, many of whom thought they had no alternative but to do their constitutional duty and vote for impeachment. Brenda Weinapple, I'll give you the last word here. Of course, a lot of people are studying these moments in history to see if there are lessons to be learned. What do you see in the way of echoes of past impeachment proceedings or parallels between those proceedings in the past and the one we're seeing today? Well, one interesting uh, parallel is the fact that there was an election coming. Um, Johnson was impeached in February of 1868. The trial started very soon after that. And by May, you have the Republican National uh, Convention starting to nominate a candidate. So that was a consideration, a very important consideration, determining how some of the uh, members of Congress voted. And as you probably know, Johnson was acquitted by only one vote. So there are a lot of politics that come into play in addition to the constitutional issues. The interesting thing finally, though, is that Johnson was impeached. He was not removed. He was not convicted. But he goes down in history as one of the few presidents, one of the two, one of the only two to be impeached. And that's a stain that will stay on his record forever. That is just a brief look at three important mm -hmm. moments in our American history. Brenda Wineapple, Timothy Naftali, and Peter Baker. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.